Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, and, you know, good morning. My name is Damian Paletta. I'm a senior economics correspondent here at The Post. Um, thanks to everyone for being here uh, in person and online. I'd like to really thank Administrator Edwards for joining us this morning. And before we get started, I uh, wanted to let our audience know that on, uh, online and in the room, you can tweet questions for Administrator Edwards using the hashtag takingflight. Um, so, obviously, there's a lot going on in Washington today and, and these days, but it's possible in five or ten years we could look back at this bill as being one of the biggest moments in 2018. You know, explain why you think th this bill could have, um, you know, lasting impact f for Americans uh, and even people around the world. Uh, Damien, first of all, and thanks to the Washington Post for having me. Uh, this is a great forum, and uh, you've got a good panel lineup uh, throughout the uh, throughout the morning here. Uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to, to to answer some questions, and as you say, kind of relate some of the impact of what happens here in Washington uh, to the traveling public and the safety of the traveling public, but also how they live their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, the FAA bill, if, taking a step back, because what an FAA bill and what. Right. That means to people is is uh, kind of part of sometimes some things that it's not very clear. Uh, every now and then the FAA reauthorization bill comes forward because we rely on the authorizers to provide authority for us to spend airport money, and that means big infrastructure investments at airports all over the country, big and small. Uh, one of the key elements of the FAA reauthorization bill that's being considered uh, now in the Senate is. Um, uh, key investments, over $3 billion in the AIP program, plus a supplemental billion dollar uh, investment into airports. Infrastructure is a key priority of the Department of Transportation, and uh, you know we're happy to see uh, some investment opportunities go forward there. Uh, as it relates to the agency's operation, it's always good when we can have long-term stable funding. It allows us to plan the infrastructure investments. It allows us to plan our modernization programs so that we can upgrade the existing air traffic control system. Uh, at the same time, it allows us to address key policy issues. One of the big issues that we'll probably talk more about is how we safely integrate drones, mm -hmm. address security issues, and there's a lot of things to like in the bill there. Uh, Process-wise, the bill just passed the House uh, last night. It was 398 to, I think, 23 votes. Which is really unusual, right, in, these days in Washington to get a bipartisan bill like that. What is it about the bill that you think lets people kind of put their swords down and, you know, cut a deal like this? Transportation policy is a good place where people can come together and recognize the importance um, of getting legislation done. And that's something that we've seen uh, in the past with FAA reauthorizations. And so... Uh, uh, the, the effort to address member priorities and to address administration priorities uh, to the extent they were able to was, uh, is, is seen in the strong vote that you have. Process-wise, it's now headed to the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, they also passed a short-term extension to give the Senate a couple of times, or a couple of, couple of days uh, in order to consider the legislation with the PAC calendar they have. So the table is set. Right, and and the bill had did it ha have all the priorities that the administration was seeking? Were there any things that you guys hoped would be in there that maybe you're gonna have to revisit later? I know that the um, air traffic control issue was something that was talked about a lot earlier last year, but is that something that just wasn't you know there wasn't the political uh, you know um, will willpower to get done right now? Uh, as it relates to air traffic reform, there there wasn't the votes in the in the house mm -hmm. to see that move forward. Uh, Bill Schuster was a uh, an effective champion and really uh, understood the issue and, and pushed it as far as he could. Right. But unfortunately, the votes weren't there in the in the House. Um, but there are key elements moving forward that address security elements as it relates to drones. Um, and there was, a, for instance, a, a big priority that was included was uh, language that reflects an administration proposal authorizing the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice uh, to take action when drones get in the hands of hostile actors to protect their assets and to protect the public. Well, let's talk about that, actually, because it is, it is a big part of this bill, and it's almost a, an area that um, it maybe has gotten out past regulators because it's developed so quickly. You know, do you, what opportunities do you see for the use of drones and, and the government's um, role? And also, what risks are there in, in how drones are being used, and what do we need to be kind of watching for? Yeah, first on the, on the opportunities, uh, the, 
One of the things we're excited about at the Department of Transportation and the FAA is the rollout of our drone IPP, the Integration Pilot Program, because what's exciting about that and sorry, a drone is the size of this table? Or it's a, it, okay. it, it, it's uh, many, many consumer drones are about the size of this table, mm -hmm. under 55 pounds fly around. Some of them even lighter than five pounds. Uh -huh. Really, most of them are, are very small. Uh, but they can be bigger, and they can have a, a wide array of, of capabilities, depending on, on the platform. And what's neat about the drone pilot program is the ability that we, we sought cities to come to us with industry partners to say, how is it that you want to use drones? What sort of waivers do we need to put in place to protect safety, but also allow inventive uses? And what we're seeing out of this, were 10 sites selected across the country uh, with a variety of different uh, capabilities. Some are uh, packaged and, or uh, food delivery items. Others are assisting law enforcement with on-scene response to be sure first responders have more information when they get on scene. Um, and uh, you know all sorts of different applications, medical deliveries, and so forth. What's exciting about that is that it helps us as a regulator understand what are the technical and policy challenges that we'll face, so that we can open the door for routine use in a way that's safe and actually uh, improves the lives of everyday Americans. The on the security side. The capabilities that kind of uh, create opportunity in the economy also create some uh, potential uh, security risks if in the hands of the wrong actor. Most drone users are out there either having fun or looking to create a business out of it, which mm -hmm. is exciting. Uh, but in, as we've seen in world events, uh, they, they can Venezuela, be- Venezuela, yeah. That's right, they can be used. And that's something that's really caught the attention of our security partners in the federal government. That's the, why this, this uh, legislative proposal as it relates to the DHS and DOJ's authority is so important. It allows us to act and, uh, and, and, and act when we need to in order to protect public safety and security. One other element of it that's very important that's part of this bill um, is uh, the Congress has, has reversed course as it relates to limiting the FAA's authority to have reasonable regulation on drones. Um, until, if this bill passes, uh, the FAA will finally now have the ability to require um, uh, technologies that help us know who's flying the aircraft and know, and know who it is. Being able to Even discern, a 12 year old who got it for Christmas and wants to fly it around their yard? I think the, the, the rules will go through a rulemaking process, mm -hmm. and so I think that's something still left to be decided from a public policy perspective, but knowing who is in the air helps discern intent. Right. Knowing whether or not it is uh, you know, a routine delivery that you don't really have to care about helps law enforcement and helps the public understand whether that's something to be concerned about. When you can narrow the field, you really take care of a lot of the security and safety concerns. One of the things that we're obviously talking about a lot in Washington now is trade secrets and you know um, foreign countries. I, mean, I imagine a lot of these drones are made overseas. Is there any risks from your perspective in terms of having Chinese technology over our you know um, you know yards and parks and maybe national monuments? You know, might be something as innocent as an eighty-dollar drone, or you know maybe it's not. Who knows? Is, is, are there risks that the FAA needs to look at there? I think typically we tend to focus on the aviation safety right. impact mm -hmm. at the agency. When we step out of our lane, sometimes we can get it wrong. <laughs> and so uh, from an aviation safety perspective, it's really more about making sure that aircraft doesn't run into another aircraft or create hazard for right. the, 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 the uninvolved public. Uh, so our focus will be on on the aviation safety impacts. Now, another part of this bill, uh, you know, it's almost kind of like a back to the future uh, component is supersonic flight. Yeah. Can, can you explain what the bill does um, in terms of that area and what kind of things it make, it's making you guys think about even more than you were already thinking about? No, that's great. It's it's another another element of the bill that we welcome. The bill does direct uh, the FAA to take an international leadership role in developing standards for the reemergence of supersonic flight. Uh, probably one of the biggest inhibitors to the new generation of supersonic flights are people's memories of the past. Right. Uh, the Concorde was a loud airplane, and it had a hard time economically making sense, uh, and it was out of reach for most Americans. What we're excited about with the uh, with the new reemergence of supersonic flight is the manufacturers that have come forward with ideas are pointing to technological uh, improvements in engine design and also airframe design that mitigate a lot of the impacts or potentially mitigate a lot of the impacts associated with noise or otherwise. 
So uh, the reason we're excited about supersonic aviation is it really has the potential to change the way we fly around the world. Uh, bringing the world closer together, uh, New York to London in under three or four hours is, uh, is important in the way we do business. Being in front of people matters. The opportunity to open new tourism opportunities uh, around the world is important. Um, so there are a lot of technical issues still yet to be worked out. Um, but one of the kind of hallmarks of this administration and the department is that we're open to innovation. We want to take in the opportunity, learn what uh, the technical capabilities are, and uh, and see where that leads us. In, but in to the be super discussion. to be supersonic, you do you need to break the sound barrier? I mean, is that the technical? Yes. Okay. And so to do that, obviously you make noise, not just the, the, from the engines, but because you've you've created a sonic boom. I imagine. Mm -hmm. do, how do how can the FAA? obviously deal with the safety component and get that right, but also deal with the people who maybe like don't want to be waking up and have their dog go bananas right. you know, at six in the morning because there's a big explosion in the sky. No, that <laughs> and across the country, right? Maybe some areas are more open to it than others. How do you deal with that? That's, that's a good question. And I think as it relates to the safety, the airplane will have to go through right. safety certification procedures. And we're, we've got great experience in how to ensure the safe uh, operation of the aircraft. As it relates to the, the sonic boom, I think, first of all, we need to assess what that boom will sound like. Uh, the the um, manufacturers believe that not just in airframe designs, but also potentially how you fly the airplane, you can have a mitigating impact on what that noise is. I think in the near term, people are focused on transoceanic uh, trans flight. Mm -hmm. That's where uh, it appears there are business models that can support uh, the ventures going forward. And over time, when we better understand what those sonic boom profiles look like, uh, we can assess whether the public will accept uh, flying transcontinental. But you have to have the conversation about what's technically feasible before you start ruling out uh, flight options going forward. And when you talk about transcontinental, how tricky is it to coordinate, let's say the United States is very comfortable with the approach maybe you know France has a much different approach right mm -hmm. and they're also making supersonic planes how do you coordinate that how do you make sure that that is kind of streamlined in a way that both sides feel comfortable well we uh, we we of course engage with our international partners mm -hmm. and um, are they also plan moving ahead on supersonic or are they some seem more eager to see it than others yeah and from the FAA's perspective our role is to ensure that whatever technical or regulatory environments would be uh, uh, mutually recognized and otherwise um, uh, safe and certifies right. for the operation of the aircraft. Um, and so it's really to the, the operators and the businesses that are trying to um, uh, develop this technology to create markets overseas. But where there's interest, we have the opportunity to work direct bilateral from the aviation or the FAA to the aviation authorities overseas or through ICAO, which will play a big role in how we set uh, standards on uh, supersonic aircraft going forward. So that international engagement, both from the company side and from the regulatory side, will be a big part of, uh, of seeing this forward. Now we hear a lot about you know, space and more, com more private companies getting into, trying to get into that business. You know, do you see opportunities for more um, private businesses in that arena? And is there a way that they can work more closely with the with FAA, or is it an area that's kind of jumbled up right now and needs some time to, to be sorted out? Now, we we welcome the engagement from the commercial space entities um, that we that we know and those that are looking to, to participate. Uh, I looked at a slide earlier, the, the, the global uh, commercial space economy is roughly in the order of $350 billion a year. Um, the launch element of that is roughly $5 billion, but you can imagine it's a very important element right. of getting to space. <laughs> So the, the role that the FAA plays is in licensing commercial space launches, getting them safely through the atmosphere, and then, uh, as we've recently seen, something I'm excited about, when you land a booster, I mean, come on, that's like something out of the future. Right. And, uh, and, and yet it's being done on a, on a more regular basis, and that's kind of the mindset of how we make long-term space exploration something that's uh, achievable, sustainable, and, uh, and creates opportunities. As it relates to kind of who's entering the field, we've got some big players that have been more public. A lot of times what's unseen is all the startups that come in the aftermath of that lift being capable. Uh, right now, the administration is underway on a big regulatory reform 
uh, to revise the FAA's commercial space regulations to streamline and, and uh, improve the way we do business. The regulations that are currently in place, very prescriptive, tell you how to do things. We're looking to transition to a risk-based, data-driven, performance-based regulation so that a, a, an operator would have to come and just get a single license uh, in order to move forward. And do you think, I mean, obviously, uh, um, for, for satellites and things like that, you can see the immediate need for, for this and the immediate use of it, but how far off are we, you know, space tourism, um, research and development, how far away is that on the commercial side? It's an important part of it, and I think uh, I, I don't know that I should put a timeline on private industry's right. uh, efforts because you know they're going to want to get it right. And and uh, but I know they're 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 pressing hard. And space tourism is is something. Uh, part of what is I think captures the public's imagination about that is you know human beings love to explore. Of course. And so that's something that you know for some this will provide an opportunity to go see the curvature of the Earth and actually go to space. And that's exciting. But as you mentioned, in addition to the space tourism element. Having routine, low-cost access to even suborbital space creates research opportunities that's exciting for the scientific community. And so I think what we'll see is uh, there are some lead actors right now and uh, other people with ideas on the drawing board. And uh, our role will be to make sure that they get up through the atmosphere and back safely. Uh, but it's exciting to play uh, a part in that. You know, Just to kind of pause and kind of yeah. take a second, we just spent a little while talking about Drones. We're talking about supersonic airplanes. We're talking about you know space ventures. This is an exciting time to be a policy person at the FAA, and our workforce is motivated. Our workforce is excited to be a part of this, and it's uh, it's a it's a really really kind of awesome era of aviation. Well, it's it's actually good to be excited because you're entering, I think the the part of the calendar for your job where the FAA is in, you know, people are traveling a lot for Thanksgiving and Christmas, everyone's got a complaint, we just passed this bill, oh my God, my seat's too small, why didn't they fix this in three weeks? You know, how long could it take? Obviously the seat size thing is part of this bill because, and, and also the cell phone, talking on the cell phone ban, but how, how much of that component, customer service, is um, part of what you guys have to deal with in addition to kind of the you know, new frontier stuff that we just talked about. Right. At the, at the FAA, our focus is on the safety certification right. of flying and making sure the traveling public can fly safely without thinking about it, right? A lot of the customer service issues reside up at the uh, office of the secretary of the department mm -hmm. uh, in the general counsel's office. And if, if the bill passes is, and right. the table is set, like I said, in the Senate, uh, we'll, we'll look at our legislative implementation plan in order to carry out the mandates, and we'll address all of those attendant issues as we, as we go. And do you foresee, because the economy is doing so well, you know, more and more, you know, maybe a record number of Americans traveling in the second half of this year or the last quarter of this year, and if so, you know, could that put strain on the, you know, infrastructure, both at airports and also air traffic control? Because I imagine if, you know, people, because of the tax cuts or whatever, feel like they have more money, they're going to go mm -hmm. see grandma or maybe get out of town and go to Hawaii, that could kind of flood the airports <laughs> at a time when they're already pretty packed. It's true, the economy is booming, and uh, that has an impact on people's ability to go travel, whether it's to go see family, take a vacation. Right. So it, the, 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 the air traffic control system and its ability to meet demand has a big role in, in continuing that economic growth. Uh, so we will look to the mandates in the bill in order to improve our delivery of those air traffic systems. Uh, last year, I think we had over 940 million people fly in the United States, amazing. which is amazing. Almost a billion people. That's, that's just uh, that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around when you think about. Uh, and, and, and that's the people who fly are important, but also the aviation services that uh, deliver to people who don't fly, the flowers that you get from overseas or the next day air delivery that you depend upon uh, in air cargo is, uh, is something that has a big impact. So uh, we recognize that the agency our uh, big impact on keeping the airspace as safe and efficient as possible so that we can meet the meet, need, meet the needs of the traveling public. Well, th um, thanks so much. We're out of time, Administrator Edwards, but it was really great to, to be with you and to open this this um, day for the Post. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jackie Alemany, who will lead our uh, next conversation about key items on the congressional agenda affecting the aviation industry. But thank you so much, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Okay. All right.